to a special event here live at the ACE 2017 conference. This is our second time here for Six Degrees of Association. Woo! Oh. <laughs> Most of you know we're the only online TV show that's dedicated to the pursuit of association success. I'm your host, Sarah Gonzalez from Redback Conferencing, and once again, I'm joined by my co-host over here, Andrew McCallum from the Association of Corporate Council Australia. We're back. Thank you. Good. And a little surprise to be invited back, to be yeah, honest, after last and we're year. Yeah, minus one, as you can tell, again, with Rob. He's yeah. um, been removed from there, but that's okay because we're doing quite well. We've got two other amazing people by our side today. Rob who? Yeah, exactly. So, um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you everyone for joining and for those of you watching online. I'd also like to welcome our two very special guests for today. So, most of you probably know Graeme Catt, the CEO of the Australian Veterinary Association and President of Ose. How are you today? Very good. Thanks very for good. joining. Thanks for having me. And secondly, we've got Sam, wait a minute, Ref Shorgi. Nailed it. Good. <laughs> From Matee. Thank you for joining us as well. Thanks for having us. So first, uh, firstly, welcome gentlemen, great to have you here. We're going to throw all sorts of questions to you both and we're going to discuss what you guys do, how you're impacting the sector and what we can learn from you. But first of all, we're going to go to our regular segment, which is thumbs up, thumbs down. So I will be the gentleman and I will hand it over to you <laughs> to start. Thank you. Um, there's a tremendous irony in this first thumbs up on my behalf today because 12 months ago in Canberra I copped a bit of flack for giving a thumbs down to Ozae. Um, still getting emails from them. Uh, it's, it's all great. I'm just sending you emails from different email addresses. <laughs> um, but I'm really excited to do the 180 today and um, do a thumbs up to Ozae for their decision to appoint Tony Brearley as the new CEO. I think there's a tremendous uh, it's something all organisations should aspire to, to be able to promote leadership from within. So, fantastic choice. Um, I'm sure I speak for a lot of people here that have dealt with Tony over a number of years that say she'll do a fantastic job. And uh, thumbs up to the Aussie board for making that appointment. Thumbs down. That was great. Thumbs down. <laughs> so, all is forgiven, Graham, is that right? <laughs> um, thumbs down. <laughs> Um, thumbs down. Can you believe this? The Australian, I read this recently. The Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Not Commission has just had to deregister 550 Australian charities this year alone for failing to meet their reporting requirements. Um, it's hard to believe, but, you know, unfortunately, it reflects on the whole NFP se sector. And, you know, running a business, you have certain obligations. Running a charity, you have significant obligations. And part of being a charity is meeting those obligations. So, unfortunately... 550 is an extraordinary amount of charities that have had to be deregistered for failing to meet their basic operating obligations. Mm. What do you got, Sarah? Oh, my turn already. Mm. That was the quickest you've ever been, so thanks for that. Um, thumbs up, and this ties into a lot of... Uh, yesterday, I was part of the Learning Lab um, with Angie from Uptify, um, and we discussed uh, the Redback Report, which we've recently released, and it all comes down to the use of video within education for the association sector. Now, one of the things um, that we've seen is the use of video for CPD-related events, and um, we've actually been working with the Institute of Public Accountants, and they've actually come along and they've invested much more into their digital program. So they've really gotten away from delivering the traditional education model when it comes to online presenting, which is just having a PowerPoint there and talking to people and talking at members in terms of educating them. And they're actually now using high quality video, they're engaging with their presenters and it's much more compelling. So they've gone out there, they've listened to what their members want and they're now de delivering education that's much more valuable than just a simple PowerPoint presentation. So big thumbs up to them. Uh, we've been working with yeah. them recently um, and it's, it's working as well and it's you know they understand it's more about just doing stuff and talking at people online it's much more about engaging people and getting them involved but also delivering high quality content as well so big thumbs up to them Cool. Thumbs down. Um, and I actually forgot to bring it with me, but a few weeks ago um, through OZE, I actually read the recent survey by ASI, so Advanced Solutions International. Um, and one of the things that came out of this, and um, if you've got a chance, head over to their booth and take a look at the survey. So um, they went out and they surveyed over 380 membership-based organisations. 
And one of the big things I actually found in the survey came down to measuring engagement and having systems in place. And it just seems like it doesn't seem like a huge focus for many membership organisations out there. So um, from the survey, and this is just taken a short snippet of it, 28% of those surveyed actually had membership engagement plans in place. However, the top two goals for the respondents were to increase member retention and member engagement. So surely there's a correlation there. We want to achieve this, but we're not doing this. And to me, that just seemed a little bit all over the place. It's a bit backwards. Yeah, and then on top of this, um, the survey also showed that 60% of associations still use separate and multiple systems. So surely that makes their top two challenges even more unachievable if they've got systems all over the place and they're not talking to each other. So my thumbs down is more of um, you know, something we can aspire to, I guess. So you know, we've got these challenges out there and we know what we need to do, so maybe let's just start doing them. That's mine. It's a good thing mine were short too, I'm yeah, just saying. Yeah, exactly. Any thoughts on that, gentlemen, before we get on to you guys? Um, is this working? I think you need to turn it on. My thought is my mic's not working. Yeah, it is on. Yep. Um, yes, yeah, we've... Uh, at the ABA at the moment, going digital is our big focus, and a large part of that is driven by, uh, it's sort of in that sense of being consciously incompetent. So the more you start to want to find out what your challenges are, the more you start to mine your data, the more you start to realise that having a CRM and an event system and a learning module system and all the things that don't talk to each other. And, you know, I guess from a CEO perspective, you're after fast answers as well, being able to tap into data and asking someone, can you tell me X, and then finding out that X will take three staff five days to sit down and manually mm. pull out as they go across multiple systems. Mm. To be flawed anyway, it's very difficult. So, yeah, we're, we're investing very heavily in digital at the moment, and it's really all about getting those systems back to a point where they're not heavily customised, and we can actually go in. And to me, it's, it's asking questions like that. Mm. Tell me how engaged my members are. Yeah. Tell me what my members buy, how much do they spend, simple questions about real life behaviour, uh, not about just receiving reports and then trying to figure them out. So it's a big thing and I think it's a, it's a big thing for the future if they're actually going to grow and prosper. Mm. Okay. I think one of, the, uh, one of the challenges there as well is that the, the concept of taking things digital is, is really sexy and everyone thinks, mm. oh, we've got to, got to go into the digital age, everything's got to be tech based or through one system. But, um, sometimes it, it's actually better to stop and consider what the objectives are, what your actual challenges are, and work through which systems are going to be able to help you achieve that. I've, I've learnt the hard way. Um, don't get uh, taken by the good salesman who makes you think that their system is going to do everything, because it never will. And so take the time to look at what's out there and, um, and pick what's right for you before you go down that track of, of bringing in a whole lot of new systems because it can actually take you a whole lot more time. Mm. Yeah, that's really true, Sam. We've, we've been 18 months in scoping. Yeah. So in order to choose a vendor. Wow. So we've learnt, we've learnt the hard way and I think that's our lesson is, yeah, understand what you need, understand what you're trying to do and before you even go and choose a vendor or go purchase it, go through all that process of discovery and diligence so you're making wise choices based on what you need. Mm. Sounds like you're far smar smarter than I am, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Give <yourself. Last> years. <laughs> <laughs> Should we put you guys together in the middle and you can battle it out? Um, so let's start with you and let's really get into this discussion. We really want to have a chat with both of you. We feel like you've got a lot to add to today's episode. But first off, Sam, can you tell us a little bit... Where are you? There you are. A little, you right? <laughs> a little bit about Batia and what you guys do um, and your mission to change the world, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's re really exciting to be uh, to be asked to, to talk on the show. Um, I guess I'm coming here from a bit of a different perspective. But is not an association. We call ourselves a for-purpose organisation, um, which I see is just a positive way to, to say you're a non-for-profit. Mm. Um, I'd much prefer to focus on what we do do, not what we don't do. Yeah. Um, but we run uh, mental health programs for young people. So taking a preventative educational approach to try and get more young people talking about mental health and then being empowered to be able to get support when they need it. Mm. And so the way that we do that is that we train young people who have a lived experience with mental ill health, so a story that they would like to share. 
We train them to be able to share that in a safe and effective way. And then we take them back into schools and universities to show other young people that it's okay to not be okay, mm. um, that there is support out there and that going and putting your hand up and being vulnerable and saying, I do need support, I do need help is actually something that should be viewed as a strength and not a weakness and mm. something that we should encourage. And I guess a lot of the times, um, many of us are fortunate enough to be working in areas where we're so passionate about something and we're really close to a cause. How did you actually get involved in Batir? Yeah, so I was lucky enough to know the founder um, of Batir, Sebastian Robinson, who, uh, who started up the organisation uh, based off the back of his own lived experience, his own battles with depression. Um, and when he was getting it started, I was working at another non-for-profit, working with young people in schools and universities. So there was a fair bit of crossover mm. in the way in which we did things. Um, he invited me along to his first training session um, and I was surrounded by 10 young people who shared stories uh, that absolutely blew me away. Things about depression, about anxiety, uh, eating disorders, bipolar, things that I just had no idea were going on all around me. Um, and I felt that I wanted to do as much as I could from that point to try and get those stories and create that environment for as many other people as possible. Yep. Uh, so I managed to talk my way onto the board as a director, um, which was about three and a half years ago. And then when Sebastian, the founder, uh, was getting ready to, uh, to move on. He asked me if, it, if I'd like to take on or take over the growth of his baby. Um, and I, for some reason, said yes, and I've been CEO for a bit over two years. Great. So, I mean, talking a bit about what the good work that Batir does, I'm interested to know a bit more about the funding model for the organisation. Yeah, so um, at, at the very beginning, we made a conscious decision not to go for government funding. Um, because we were a new, sort of innovative, unique way to approach the issue, uh, we didn't want to be tied down to the government's way of doing things or, I guess, held, uh, held to one side of, of government or another. Um, and then what I've seen uh, a lot happen with non-for-profits, especially trying to do great things with young people, is that if they're government funded, they go in and promise the world and then the next year they're not there and young people actually uh, suffer in the end. So still to date, five and a half years later, we haven't had any government funding. So what we do is, is spread that across a range of different funding sources. So one of which is a fee-for-service model. So schools and universities actually pay a contribution for us to go and deliver the program mm -hmm. for their students. Um, and then we also have uh, corporate partners, uh, through, usually through the foundations, uh, within different corporates who fund the programs, philanthropic foundations as well, and then there's a whole range of fundraising and events that bring in another source of revenue for us as well. So it's quite diverse and spread across, pretty evenly across those uh, revenue streams. Okay. So on that last bit there, when you actually go out and you speak to corporates, because we've spoken in a few episodes in the past about sponsorship and how to get sponsorship and how a lot of the times a lot of associations actually undersell themselves when they are going to actually... Um, fund what they're doing. So when you go out and you sit there, you bring a lot of passion to the issue, I can tell. What do you actually, how do you approach it? Do you have a model or how do you recommend other organisations go out there when it comes to sponsorship and gaining that from the corporate sector? Yeah, look, I, it's, it's a really good question and I think um, something that, that every time you go through that process or that conversation, you learn something and get better at it. I don't think uh, from my perspective, there's a right or a wrong way to do it. You've got to find, I guess, integrity in the way that works best for you. One, one great line um, that an old uh, CEO of mine used to say is, in, in the, the non-for-profit sector, you've got to take a, a approach using language of opportunity, not obligation. What we have, whether it's in an association or within a for-purpose or a non-for-profit, is a great opportunity to connect, whether it's corporate, whether it's community, whether it's associations, um, with something that really matters and can really make a difference. Mm. And you've got to work out how to best sell that mm. because that is an amazing opportunity a lot of corporates don't have. So I think in order to do that, what you really need to find are corporates and organisations that values are aligned with yours as an organisation. For us, for example, if an organisation really doesn't care about wellbeing or mental health, it's going to be pretty hard for us mm. to find a, a connect point with them. So we do a lot of research 
before we even make a, a phone call as to where their values are, where, what their strategic plan looks like, whether mental health and wellbeing is a part of what they're trying to achieve as an organisation. Um, and then if that aligns, you can get sort of to the front door. And then from there, it's working out where you can really add value to what they're trying to achieve as an organisation, whether it's for us, uh, providing um, mental health or preventive educational programs for their staff, whether it's giving them access to the audience or the market that we can attract, whether they're trying to, um, I guess, market or advertise to young people, that might be another point of value for them. Um, whether it's trying to become closer connected to the community or have an opportunity to provide and open, uh, provide events or open their doors up to the broader community. You've really got to look at that reciprocal nature of a partnership and look at what's in it for them and how, how you can add value to what they're trying to achieve. I like that sense, you're selling opportunity. It sounds really good. But bringing you into the conversation, Graham, one are. thing we spoke about, <laughs> you're here. One thing uh, Sarah and I did speak about a few weeks ago was that concept of underselling, <laughs> underselling yourselves to corporates. So, um, you know, do you think as a sector, the associations or the not-for-profit sector does undervalue or undersell themselves when they're going to corporates? I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure whether undersell is is the right word. I think we. It's interesting listening to Sam talk because although the community he refers to is quite different to the community which is our profession, our industry, and the veterinary sector, a lot of the same principles still apply. Mm. Um, I think we kind of. I think we kind of undersell and oversell at the same time. I think uh, our corporate support probably falls into two categories. I think one's one's quite transactional. There are people limited budget. They want to come to your event and they've got clear up, you know, I need to I need leads, I need I need an ROI on this investment. And our task with those people is to is to deliver the maximum in line with the business outcomes that they have achieved. But then like Sam, I think there's there's another area, and I would say the same thing applies for us, where if we focus on the transactional, that's where we undersell, because exactly what you're saying, we don't investigate the opportunities that we have with the company. So the opportunities to be aligned, to understand their business a little bit better, to think about if we knew a little bit more about what each other's trying to achieve, could we do something new and different? Um, I'm a little bit envious listening to your story because, you know, I think about something that's a few years old, that's innovative, that's trying to create a new funding model. The ABA is pushing 100, so it's our 100th birthday in 1921. And so, you know, we're obviously about evolution rather than innovation. We're trying to push the boundaries, but to do it very slowly. Um, but I, I think it's not, it's not so much that we undervalue, I think it's perhaps that we don't understand uh, that, that bigger market and have those conversations about what business are you really in, what are you trying to achieve, how do you align with us, and how can we do something a little bit different that doesn't fall into our model. And it's, you know, it's tough because we're busy people, you're really a CEO, a sponsorship manager, whatever your role is, whatever your organisation is, we've only got limited time. So. How do you do that? How do you find the time to actually invest in, in relationships? But you know, I guess the thing I'm learning as I go on is what's increasingly becoming redundant is the transactional mm. nature mm. of these relationships. It's getting old, it's getting tired. It's the exploring the relationship and saying, okay, how do we, how do, we do something together? And I would say most of, our, most of our corporate supporters would be at the bigger end, would be waiting for that to happen. Mm. Because they've been in these models as well for the last 10 years, the last 20 years, the last 30 years. You know, their world's changing, they're merging, they're amalgamating, they've got corporate masters in the US or Europe. Um, and so bringing them opportunity and having that conversation together and say, how do we do it? I think that's how we get the value proposition from us back on the table. Mm. So that's a bit of a long, complicated answer to a, a short <laughs> question. As I expect nothing less. <laughs> I do agree, you know, even coming from the corporate side of things to your point, Sam, when you are talking about aligned values, um, for us as corporates, we're always looking, you know, um, social responsibility is huge, but we want to align ourselves with an organisation that does reflect the same values and not just want to go into sponsorship for the sake of sponsorship or to be seen to, um, you know, the people who we need to be seen to, to be just, in, you know, sponsoring something for the sake of it. So I think it's really important to have those values. And is that what you look for when you seek out corporates? Yeah, we do, funnily enough, listening to Sam as well. Look, as you were talking then, I was thinking, you can't, integrity, you can't buy it. 
Mm. And people sniff out authenticity is becoming more and more what people are looking for, what consumers are looking for, what our members are looking for, and you can sniff it a mile away. You can't buy integrity, you can't buy alignment, it's got to be genuine. Mm. But you can work towards it, yep. you can set an aspiration as a corporate and say this is where we want to be, we believe this is important, we want to partner with someone like Sam in order to get ourselves there, mm. and there's authenticity in that. But, um, you know, having a tech... So for us, it's probably a very similar thing. You know, our members look at the companies in their sector that are genuinely helping them, mm. that are genuinely driving innovation or genuinely contributing to sector growth or helping their business, and they know who those companies are. So we look, we look for very similar things, which is, are they aligned with our values? But that integrity question is still the same thing because a big partnership with lots of money flowing in from someone who's on the nose when it comes to our members and industry generally doesn't really do anybody any favours. Mm. And again, it reeks of inauthentic inauthenticity, is that a word? Yeah. Um, and yeah, it doesn't do anything. Long-term relationships, again, rather than transactional ones, depend on that relationship persevering beyond a couple of years. Mm. And that's not going to happen unless that company is either in your space with a good reputation or actively, authentically working to attain that. Yeah, so it's a big thing. All right, so let's see if you um, walk the walk then. Who are your top three corporate sponsors? Uh, the top three? <laughs> all, all of our uh, <laughs> corporate sponsors are in the top three. Ah, um, good answer. <laughs> There's no favourite children, Sam. Uh, yeah, I'd, uh, I'll, give, I'll give you a, a, a couple of different angles because I think the relationships between them are, are mm. quite different. So um, Macquarie Bank, through the, uh, through the uh, Macquarie Group Foundation, have been a supporter of Batir since the very beginning. And, um, and speaking of sort of those long-term relationships, I think it's a perfect example. Um, and, and I couldn't help to think as we were talking, you know, it's, it's kind of like chatting up someone at a bar. Mm. And if, if you, you want a one-night stand, then you're probably just trying to sell them with the glitz and glam and not, not think about what really matters to you. Whereas if you want to create a long-term partnership, maybe date for a couple of months or you know, take it to the next level, um, you actually need to let them talk to you and find out what really matters to them. Mm. Um, and that's kind of what we've done with Macquarie Bank over the last four or five years, where we've listened to, to where their strategic direction is for the foundation, how we fit into there, and then developed our partnership to align with that. Um, and so that's been a longer term one, so Macquarie Bank, um, a very different organisation that's uh, recently come on board about a year ago is a group called Diona, who are a big construction company. Um, so one that you, you probably wouldn't recognise as, as a really close alignment between um, a, a youth mental health organisation and a big construction company um, that has cranes and, and work sites all over, all over the country. Um, but they realised that mental health was a big issue within their industry. Um, and uh, funnily enough, they also have a lot of Irish people working for them. So the way that that relationship works is that they've actually connected us with the Irish community who run a bunch of different fundraisers and events throughout the year that we now get some of the proceeds for. And so we're building the relationship with the corporate partner through their workforce and the, the broader community to help them be able to help their, their, uh, their staff. So Diona's um, another, another big partner of us. And then a very different one again is a group called Good Shift, um, who are essentially a organisation that operate in, in a similar way to association in which they bring in um, new startups that are looking to operate in the social purpose space and help to grow and develop them. Um, but they support us off the side of that and we sort of help to support some of the younger um, organisations that are coming up as well. So good shifts the third. Hmm. I like the way you welded some dating advice into that answer actually, yeah. Sam. Good yeah. job. <laughs> Listen to them, let them talk How's to you. How's your um, dating game going with your sponsors? Yeah, that's good. I haven't, I haven't swiped right on any of our sponsors <laughs> recently. Um, I, uh, I actually, I like Sam's methodology, so I'm going to use it. So rather than, look, I'll, I'll tell you three that probably are on the top list for us, and they come from quite different places again. So one of our biggest uh, corporate partners is a, um, is a pet nutrition company. Um, but their business model globally is entrenched on working through associations to uh, with, with the veterinary associations around the world. Um, so they invest heavily, and again, their ethos is we invest in the profession, mm. not we give money to organisations to access market. 
Uh, they invest very heavily in uh, new graduate programs, in focusing on people transitions. I have a bit of a link with some of Sam's stuff there. Um, in developing leadership. Um, so again, they kind of walk the talk when it comes to saying we put money not into transactional relationships, we put money into uh, veterinary science, and we put money into the profession itself and the development of leaders within the profession. And they would be our number one supporter, and that would be the case probably with a lot of our sister associations around the world. So that investment's global, it's not, not just Australian. Um, the second one is interesting, probably our number two supporter is a wholesaler. Um, and they are a success story. It was started by a group of vets. Um, it ran and grew very successfully for a number of years and it was ultimately bought out by Henry Shine. So it's now Shine Animal Health Australia. Um, but their CEO has been there probably pushing 20 years. Their chairman is still um, a veterinarian and a, an old one. And so their investment again is very much, um, and I won't go into the detail, but obviously there's risk in that for mm. us because they have corporate masters, they're in a different model, they're, they're owned by a publicly listed company. Um, but again, they invest in education. So they're our education partner. And that's their focus, is we want to invest, we want to align ourselves with the education of the profession. And so their investment goes into education activity and that's how they want to perceive us. And the third um, is probably Guild Insurance, who are here, who mm. may, many of you know. And again, that's a very different relationship because it's built around the provision of a member benefit, um, which is uh, indemnity insurance, business insurance for veterinarians, but it's built around a relationship which is all about risk management. So it's built around actually working together to reduce and mitigate risks in the sector, um, and obviously that's uh, very significant if you're an insurer. So again, a lot of the things that we do together aren't just straight out access to the mm. market, they're actually about trying to affect change within the profession and the sector, um, and that's mutually beneficial. So three quite different, probably at the bigger yeah. end of our, of our spectrum, but three, again, three quite different companies with three quite different goals mm. um, and um, very long-term partnerships. I've been with the ABA almost 10 years and they were there before I was here and I hope they'll be there for many years to come. Good. So I guess it's moving it to the association sector, Graham, because you are here. Um, you mentioned ABA nearly up to 100 years. How many, what would the membership be of ABA today? Uh, we have about six and a half thousand veterinary members, we have three thousand student members and we are growing probably quite recently, like a lot of other associations like us, we've probably had to grapple with the question of are we here for the vet or are we here for the vet and the broader industry they work in and how do we get that balance right. And so, Probably really this year we're increasingly starting to grow our membership of people who aren't vets but play critical roles in the industry, managers, mm. um, and we're probably pushing 200 of those members as well now, so we're getting up to around 10,000. Is a Bondi vet a member? Uh, Chris is a member. Oh, yeah. <laughs> always wanted to ask you that. Yeah, yeah. So he's really a vet. Yeah, who would have thought. Really <laughs> And, and from those, thinking of those, the actual veterinary people that have a vet science background, what's, do you sort of measure, what's, are they in it for the long haul? Are they your members that are there for the length of their career? Yeah, look, I, I think it's changing. I think there's a, there's a lot going on in our, in our profession, in our industry. I'm not a vet, I should say, for those who don't know me. Um, so when I say our profession, but I think in our organisation we talk about our profession. Um, you know, we're part of it, um, and it's, that's the ethos and the culture that we have. Um, yeah, look, I, I think traditionally, when you're a vet, you're a vet. You went to vet school, you graduated, you never left that profession, it was a great place to be. You, um, you went and worked with someone for a while, you probably got into partnership or ownership, you probably got a stake in the business or, or owned the business, you owned it, then you retired and disappeared. Um, I think fewer people are in it for the long haul, and I think that membership journey is, has really changed quite a lot where a lot of people are never going to own a business and they don't aspire to. Hmm. We have, um, I would say, currently we probably have probably about a thousand vets that would be employed by corporations, by yeah. listed or large um, hmm. companies. And four years ago, that number probably was a hundred. So we got a lot of people that, you know, they're employees. Mm. They're, never going to, they're never going down that journey of owning the practice. But within those models, there's jobs that didn't exist four years ago either. There's management roles, there's clinical roles, there's a whole range of things you can do that weren't there. So I think that that whole journey for the profession and that whole, that whole notion of kind of 
a student, graduate, journeyman, business owner, mm. retired die, um, has really has really changed. And one of the things that go with it is probably people aren't necessarily into the long haul. And our, and our challenge is how do we realign our membership? A lot of the thinking about the membership journey, funnily mm. enough, is putting that on a whiteboard. Student, graduate, mm. uh, employee, business owner, retired, and aligning membership products and services and benefits with that journey. And as the journey changes and, ch and is different, that's our challenge at the moment is to go, what's the new journey? What does it look like? And it's not linear anymore. It's kind of all over the place with people moving in and out of different places and off in different directions. So, so how do we shape our, our membership, our, our value proposition? How do we make sure the products and services we offer is something for everybody? And I think, to be frank, one of our great challenges and other professions would have the same is in moving to the new way of working where so many people are employees and are probably happily going to be employees for a very long time, how do we make ourselves relevant to them mm. and not an anachronism that is still based around the practice owner and the partner and that kind of small business model. How important, um, obviously there's a lot of people out there as well who may have members and it's very similar to you because they're at different stages in their career so you have to develop your service offering to meet that. How much of a priority should that be within an association, do you think? It depends if you want to still be around in five or ten years, <laughs> to be honest. Um, do you it, think people do it well enough? Look, I, my observation is I, I think it's really hard to shape. And so I would look at, for example, the people who come through our door to pitch member benefits to us. Mm. They're all pitched to the business. Just about 100% of them are actually going down that same notion of going, we want to give you a membership benefit. It's rarely for an employee. Mm. It's almost never for an employee working for a big company. Um, and it's, off, it's always, again, back into the practice because the vendors out there and the partners out there still seem to have this notion that that's the vet, it's the practice. Um, it's, and it's, it's like a romantic notion, I guess. We don't want to think that there's big listed companies employing a thousand vets. We want them all to be the Bondo vet. Mm. I know the Bondo vet, I know the practice. Um, so it's a bit of a, even with the best intention, you know, it, it, I'm a great believer in this framework of, you know, are you, are you unconsciously incompetent, are you consciously incompetent, and trying to move yourself up through there. Even with the best intentions, it's, it's a struggle to try and address it because mm. we are now actively going, well, how, we know what we need to do. Mm. We need to become relevant to a group of employees who work for big companies. We need to be relevant to our traditional base, which is the independent practice. Uh, we need to disenfranchise neither. Um, and how do we do that? How, mm. how do we go to the thing? But my observation would be there's not a lot of partners out there that are, that are making that happen. My, my, my own view is I think this is, you've got to be conscious of it, to your question. If you're not, you're not going to survive if you are a traditional profession like ours because they're all changing, the world is changing. And I think the answer probably lies in part of our sort of strategic ethos about membership is getting out of the products and services game. So and our, our model, again, I think is pretty archaic. Let's mm -hmm. face it, you know, I charge you a big fee to be a member, and then the benefit of being a member is I can charge you more fees to come and buy things from me. It's a bizarre model. That's why I'm envious of Sam and his, you know, it's great. I love you know, new innovative ways of doing things. Um, we've got to get out of that, and I think part of our answer is we're investing in mentoring, and hopefully you've been to some of their presentations on mentoring and taught to the art of mentoring people. But more conceptually, so as an association, I think our role is to be a mentor. Mm. It's not to be a product and service provider. It's to help you, the professional, figure out where you want to go and how you get there. And I think you know, for that for us, probably reinventing ourselves to go, that's our role, um, makes us relevant to everybody, no matter where you work, no matter where you're trying to get to, no matter how many times you move, is to be a trusted partner to help you on that journey. So um, we're a long way off being there. But strategically, I think that's probably the right move and the right move for some other associations as well. Sam, any thoughts about introducing a membership model an into an the An archaic team? membership model? That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just piggyback off what's worked for the last hundred years and do the same by the sound of it. Um, look, so I, I think the, the best answer to this is sort of. Mm. We, have, we have thought about it. Um, there are a range of different options. We, we build very strong relationships with our volunteers through universities and schools and I think there is an opportunity there to develop those people into whether it's a really engaged alumni group or a step into a membership. Mm. 
group. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there, how it works best, what the, uh, what, what the best model is, um, I'm not really sure, but I think definitely um, for organisations like us that build such an engaged group of, whether it's volunteers, whether it's um, supporters, uh, working out how to uh, develop that connection and, and offer them more and have them more involved in the future is, is a really good opportunity. So just working out how to do it's the big challenge. For those of us at the other end, I think looking at looking at organisations like SAMS, looking at the get-ups of the world, looking at the people that, that harness, harness people to achieve goals and for purpose and for cause and achieve something and move on, I think we've actually got a lot to learn from how you, how you develop new, new models that look like that. Because I think, the, as I said, I think the old ones are increasingly anachronistic and won't serve us that much longer. Thank you. Watching you. <laughs> so, Graham, one thing before we go to some audience questions, one thing I, I do want to clarify and clear up. Is it true that the AVA has a bring your pet to work day? Not really. Every no. day at the AVA is bring your pet to work day. <laughs> um, yeah, look, we, we, no, we do. We probably, it's part of our culture that we have, we have pets and we have office pets. Um, and currently I think we've got, we've got probably five dogs and a cat that circle through the office. Um, we, we've got a policy, so if you ever want to do this, get in touch with me and we learnt the hard way that having multiple animals in the office at the same time, uh, if they don't like each other they fight, if they do like each other they urinate. Um, so it's not necessarily the best way to be. We've had a lamb for a while um, that came into the office and wore a nappy, that was fun. We've had kittens, we've had a rabbit, we've had hamsters, not hamsters, what's it called? Ferret, hermit crabs. We've, we've settled back down to dogs and cats, which is probably not a bad thing. But yeah, we, um, we actually have a roster, so there's, there's probably a pet in our office every day, but we keep it under control. We have policies around behaviour, um, sort of training, you can't attack people. You know, mediation? Like that. That? Is there a mediation policy? When uh, yeah, it hasn't been used yet. <laughs> We're not allowed to put people in the middle. Um, and we have a roster, so you actually roster your pet in across the week. So there's, um, there's one there every day. But it's a really important part of who we are. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a really important part, and it connects us to what our members do. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really special part of working for us, and, and yeah, it's nice to get to bring your pet to work. I'm interested, I won't go into it, how do you police the no fighting policy among the cats and dogs? But um, we, we do have a few minutes, I think we do, for a few audience questions. So Angie Kay has a microphone for one of our two special guests, I think, behind you. Hi there, I'm Kristen from the Victorian Principals Association in Melbourne, and I'm just interested to ask you how you go about formalising your corporate partnerships. Is it a written contract or agreement that you as the association provide the corporate partner or particularly with the larger corporate partners do they give one to you that suits their regulations and controls um, to formalise and lock in that partnership? I just want to know who, who's the sort of key player in that written contract side of things. Thanks. I'll give you the old fashioned view. Sam can give you the modern one. Um, yeah, we, we have written agreements um, and we try wherever we can to be the provider of the agreement to the company. I guess the thing that we're noticing more and more is that um, particularly US-based companies, even where we're writing the agreement, um, are coming back with a whole lot of stuff around antitrust and um, needing to overlay that over what we do. But we, I think we pretty much always, we put in touch in a corporate, a corporate supporter agreement and we write it and we put the terms up and we have it checked by their legal people. Yeah, we'd often do the same. Sometimes some of the, the bigger corporates want to provide the contract themselves. Um, but unfortunately, that like we're, we're finding that there aren't that many new innovative ways of, of creating these bigger partnerships. You've kind of, a lot of the time, got to go through that initial grant process Fill, fill out the grant, then go and meet with the organisation, then work out if it's going to work before you even get to the point of working out what that, what that contract is. So, um, yeah, a lot of the time it is still the traditional way. Any other questions? Mm. Well, it did fall Any other questions? 
I'm going to have to switch mics and I'm going to have to also give a public apology to the gentleman who helped me with the audio at the back because he clipped it on and I said, no, it's fine, I'll keep it on my lap and then it's fallen and it's broken. So sorry about that. Um, no other questions? I think we'll head over to the next segment then. So drum roll. And yeah, as good as we good can one. do. Um, Andrew, so this is the most exciting part and <laughs> no offence to anyone else, but this is something that... A lot of us look forward to every single fortnight. So we send Andrew on a mission and he goes out there, looks around all over the world to try and find the most obscure association and then we spotlight them on some of the most amazing things that they're doing. So you've had some great ones this year, but I believe you've got a cracker for us today. I do, I do and thank you. Um, you better not disappoint now, I've hyped it up. <laughs> As you know, I'm a bit of a sporting tragic. Um, I could easily have seen myself being a professional athlete. Um, just, it was just the lack of talent that held me back. Um, and if only this next association was actually around 20 years ago, things could have worked out very different for me. I bring to you the International Dodgeball Association. This is a grassroots initiative that's all about advancing the sport of dodgeball globally. I'm sure we've all seen the movie. Uh, based in Vancouver, IDA, uh, they even use the acronym themselves, that's how cool this is. They're run by passionate volunteers who simply love the game of dodgeball and are passionate about sharing it with the world. I mean, they have a vision, this is, this is so cool. Imagine a world where everyone, young or old, who love the game of dodgeball can play it. I mean, that's a vision if ever I heard one. Um, they also seek to promote the spirit of uh, fun, spirit and good sportsmanship. Um, and they have this quote on their website, spreading the dodgeball love. Such a worthy endeavour. Um, and, you know, Sarah, you guys at Redback have these spacious offices. I say get rid of the billiard table, get rid of the table tennis table. You can go on the IDA website and they'll even tell you how to set up a dodgeball court in your, in your workspace. Can you imagine me playing dodgeball? I have trouble with ping pong, let alone the dodgeball. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so it's a worthy endeavour. Uh, you can find that great resource on their website. Um, but good luck to the people at IDA and uh, thank you for being featured on this segment. So much passion and excitement. Thank you. Mm, I love it. <laughs> So um, that brings us close to the end. So if anyone does have any questions, um, please take a few moments to think about them. First of all, um, at the end of every episode, we hand it over just to put our two special guests on the spot. So first of all, Graham, what gets you up raring to go within the sector? What do you love about it every single day? Look, it keeps changing. Mm. It keeps changing. Every single day is, is different. Um, something new. I'm still learning. <laughs> I kind of, it's going to sound a little bit odd, and for those who know work with me at the AVA, you'll probably understand what I mean. I still find things out about my organisation, and I've been there nearly 10 years that I didn't know before. <laughs> um, but ultimately, yeah. Look, I, I think we work. I think we work in a in a, in a profession and in an industry that's changing, and everything's going on, and everything's different. I think I'm really lucky. I've got a team of people that um, are all really passionate about what they're doing and where we're going. Uh, I think we have, to a degree, I was listening to Craig Davis talk yesterday, I think we have, to a degree, been successful in, in landing ourselves on a vision of where we're trying to get to that, that people can buy into, particularly. Um, and one of the things we did with our board is, is probably realign our thinking from being all about and thinking about our stakeholders, the member being the all-important stakeholder, to actually saying we sort of have our board, we have our staff, we have about 300 really engaged and committed members who are on committees and involved with us, um, and they're our core. And I think that was a big thing for us, to say actually staff are our key stakeholder, and it moves us closer to what, you know, really leading organisations doing out there. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I, I think I love the veterinary profession. And people we work with are just, they're great, they're really cool. Um, it's very hard to explain. I think we're very lucky, you know, we work with really smart people um, who do really interesting things, but none of them really did it to make money. It's a very altruistic profession. Um, and they got in it because they love animals, they love animal welfare, they love animal science. And so to be helping those people improve their profession to get to where they're going, and no offence to anybody else, but as opposed to people that are just in it for the money or just in it to grow the business or just in it for shareholder wealth, 
I think that's probably what makes us a really, a really cool place to work, as well as, well as being able to bring a pet to the office. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I really, I, I can't imagine getting up and going, I don't want to go to work. This just doesn't happen. There's always something waiting that's challenging, interesting. Um, let's hope that continues. Mm. If I do have any spare time, then I can think about Jose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess, Sam, to put you on the spot as well, same question. What's, you mentioned you're a for-purpose for organisation. What, what is it that gets you out of bed every morning raring to go? Um, look, it's a lot easier for me in summer because I live down near the beach, so I can go for a surf in the morning and that gets me out of bed. <laughs> I'm a bit soft and when winter comes around, it's a bit harder for me. Um, but look, again, it's a really good question because as you, know, as you heard from Graham's response, there are so many different things when you work in a sector that people are driven by purpose that motivate you um, to do what you do. I think for me, um, it's, it's, there's a range of different ways that I can come at this question. I'm, I'm really excited by the potential of what Batir can become. We've got so much opportunity because we are um, at such a young organisation, we've got the ability to be flexible and adapt to, to what's in front of us and what's coming. And so we have a really clear vision and a mission and a strategic plan of where we want to go. But um, every day that could potentially shift based off different opportunities or things that come up, which is, which is fantastic. But I think it's important, especially in, in leadership roles or times in which you're a little bit removed from the, the people that you're there to, to serve, because um, I'm not out there every day delivering these programs, working with young people, to make sure that you, you work out how you can keep that connection. And so just yesterday, actually, we got an email from a university student that was in a program that we ran last Friday, um, telling us essentially that they'd been dealing with um, pretty severe depression for a long time, but hadn't felt like they uh, had the, the right to burden other people with that, um, that reality. And so had kept it in and hadn't spoken to anyone about it for years. And just by hearing another young person open up and share their real life experience and share their story, that had empowered them to go and speak to their best friend and to go and work out how they can get professional help. And so that one story motivates, motivates me for the next month, the, me, the next quarter, the next year, because that's one of the thousands of young people that we're running programs for just this year alone. And I think as, as the sort of CEO of the organisation in different leadership positions, whatever it may be, you've got to have that real, really clear connection with what you're actually trying to achieve, and that's that individual and that community-based change. Mm, great answer. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. That brings us to the end. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. It's been great to have you here for the wrap-up, and it's also been great to listen to two very different organisations, but also to hear how similar they are in very different ways as well. So thank you, Sam. Great to learn more about Batir and to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Great to be here. And as always, Graham, um, you'll be around, no doubt, for the rest of the day. So if anyone does have any other questions, please feel free. And thank you, Andrew, for... Yeah, little plug there. Yeah, so if you'd like to hear me continue the talk for another <laughs> 45 minutes, um, come to the come to the Aptify Learning Lab. You can't have too much. Aptify Learning Lab at 10:30. But thanks for having me. Thank you, and thank you, Andrew. But before that, we do have one more question. Short one. Apologies, one late question. Um, my question's around excellence, and I think it's really interesting. You've you've got a hundred-year-old association and one that's five years, yeah. do you try to define excellence? Is that important to you, you know, in terms of defining it? And how do you measure it? Uh, because I've, to an extent, Graham, you answered it when you spoke about um, altruistic purpose, but I'll be really interested in both your answers to that. Mm. Um, yeah, look, to, I, I think... For me, and, and I guess I'm thinking back to our sort of strategic plan and our values, excellence doesn't really come into it. You know, I think everyone, if you're trying to do something, you're trying to do it the best that you can. And so um, striving for excellence or to be the best can potentially set you up to fail a lot of the time because only one person can be the best. And one person's excellence is very different to another person's. And I, th and I think... I don't think people are that 
and this is just my perspective, I, I'm not sure if people are that motivated by that anymore, especially in, in our space. I think they're motivated to do, um, to be uh, as best as they can be to support the people that they're set up to support. And, um, and so it's working out what motivates and drives the ability to do that as opposed to saying we need to be excellent at everything. Um, which is probably a bit of a different way to think about it, but, but how we've sort of developed our values and our strategic plan. Yeah, that really does put us on the spot, doesn't it? Look, I, I think excellence has meaning for my members that it doesn't have for us, because it's about clinical excellence, it's saying they're scientists. So it's about excellence in science, it's about excellence in treatment, and the word excellence does come up in what they do. So, and it's kind of black and white almost, it's very cut and dried. Um, I don't think excellence is a word that we throw around very much as an organisation, and I personally I would say I'm a little bit like Sam, I think it's a little bit, um, if, because I think your question was do you measure it, and I don't know how you measure it, how do you, you, you can measure your achievement of your own goals, my goal can be I want to be number one, um, and if you look at, I talked a little bit about our digital stuff as well, which our whole organisation is now wrapped up in this great disruptive, expensive investment in trying to be somewhere. Um, and I'd like to think, you know, you could be able to compare us to a whole range of associations or other veterinary associations and we'll be the best. Now that's, that's something that I can help people strive towards and identify. To say we're going to have excellent digital is almost a little, almost a little bit difficult. So um, I don't, we re don't really don't set out to measure it. And I think it kind of, I don't go out on a limb personally and say, I think you know when it's there. I actually think you know. When, when your people are, it's such an intangible quality, I think you know. When, when your people are doing excellent stuff, it's up to you to say, excellent work, guys. But you know it, you feel it. Um, and I think, I'm probably paraphrasing a little bit what Sam's saying, trying to get that into some sort of KPI or some sort of tangible probably removes the ability to feel it and let, feed that back to people. And because as, as leaders, I think that something's got to come from you. Know, excellent work, I, you know, it's fantastic. So again, that's my, that's my complex answer. Um, but I think that that would be my take, having been put on the spot. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> Sometimes it just is a gut feel kind of thing, isn't it, when it comes to measurement. Uh, no more questions? That brings us to the end. So I'm going to say goodbye once again. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to the panel, um, and thank you, Andrew. Give you a thank you. Thank again. you, Sarah. Um, thanks once again for everyone who's joined us for season two of Six Degrees of Association. We'll be back next year. We haven't discussed it, but let's just say that we will. Um, and remember that too much conversation always kills the chats. Bye for now.